All right, guys, it's a lovely day to you all and welcome to another edition of Elevate with Sammy. And today I'm in South Africa and I'm talking to a beautiful lady um, and her name is called Ndombi Zodwa Mahlangu. And Ndombi, welcome to Elevate with Sammy. Uh, thank you, Sammy. How are you today? I'm good in you. Uh, I'm good. Just hot, you know. We are in summer here in China and it's so hot. Uh, it's it's really, really hot. Oh, that's nice. We are in winter in South Africa and it's really cold. <laughs> wow, I can see from your cold neck. Oh, nice. I wish we could yeah. swap because right now I am wishing, you know, like I, I wish it was cold. I would love some cool, <laughs> yeah, I would love some coolness because it's really, uh, the temperatures are really, really high. Anyway, um, yes. thank you so much for taking time to be with me today to try and talk about your story and telling us who you are. I appreciate uh, you accepting uh, coming to be here with me today. Thank you so much. Now, uh, before we can actually start, maybe if you could start telling our viewers who you are and where you are in uh, South Africa. Okay, thank you for having me, Sammy. And um, I am Dombizot or Miriam Mashangu. I am in Pretoria, South Africa and I'm an education and communication officer at one of the biggest um, credit industry in South Africa. It's actually the national one. So what I do as the education and communication officer, I um, educate consumers about their rights and responsibilities pertaining to credit and what is it that they need to do in order to um, 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 sort of like um, complain if they have um, maybe issues in the credit industry and what it is it that they should be um, cautious of or maybe things that they should consider before applying for um, credit. So that's what I do. Wow. Sounds like an interesting, <laughs> interesting job. <laughs> I need credit. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, wow, that's that's a beautiful job. Anyway, um, and family-wise, do you have family? Are you married? Are you single? See someone? <laughs> I'm a single mother making it big out there. <laughs> wow, yes. Yeah, I, have, <laughs> I have one daughter that I got when I was really young. I was only 19, so I'm um, um, mom I know how it feels like so yeah my daughter just turned 15 um, now on the on the um, 14th of July so I have sisters yes I have um four um I mean three three sisters and I don't have parents they passed away during my studies my mom my father my my grandmother sorry to hear yes that. okay <laughs> yes. that's cool sounds like and how's your daughter doing She's doing very well. She she's pushing. Um, mommy tells her what to do. Um, everything, especially when it comes to um, um, education. I tell her to open her books every day. Um, <laughs> I mean, every single day. I check whether she has done her work. I don't mind her going and playing, and but I want her to first start with her work. So yeah, she's doing very well. I'm proud of her. Oh, that's nice. I'm a single mother too. Um, I've got two kids though. Anyway, um, let's just get into your job. It sounds like a really, really interesting job. How did you get it? How did you get that job? Is it something that you always wanted to do or it's something like, you know, sometimes when we look for jobs, we just say, okay, whatever job that comes, is it something that you'd say you wanted to do this particular job or it's a job that you found uh, along the way? Um, this one, I really wanted it and I got it just after I received my degree and, um, it's a very interesting job. At first I wanted to be an electrical, um, engineer, but when things couldn't work out and then I ended up studying, um, um, public administration and communication facilitation. 
So it's really interesting. I mean, interacting with people, it's what I love. So um, I, I really love it. Okay, so you are a people's person. <laughs> Yes. Nice. <laughs> yes. So uh, you, you would say it was easy to get this job or is it maybe your first no. job or you've you worked somewhere before? No, it's not my first job. My first job was um, domestic working. I worked as a domestic worker and I um, purchased myself for that and I still earned um, less than 2,000 rand. I don't know what um, is, um, I mean, um, okay. I earned less than 2,000 a, a month and I bought myself a computer, an old computer. And my employer then assisted me to upgrade a computer a bit and um, I uh, then studied. And I did the Microsoft Office. I didn't have anything then. Then I did the Microsoft Office and um, doing the Microsoft Office, then it assisted me to get employment at one of the physiotherapists working as the receptionist. And at the later stage, I ended up um, working as admin as well, doing her accounts as well. And then I studied further. I did a certificate in, in, in um, office management. And uh, when I did that certificate in office management, I um, studied um, with UNISA. It was long distance I'm learning now. And, and then at the later stage, I got employment at another um, debt collection um, um, industry as well as the biggest as well in South Africa, it's a national. So I, I worked as a PA to the CEO. And when I started working there, that's when I started with my degree. Now, I couldn't go back to, um, to do electrical engineering because I, um, I, I mean, I had to take care of my daughter as well, especially when my parents passed away. It was now my responsibility to take care of my daughter and I stayed with her. I was a full-time mother then. So I had to do something that um, could work for me that I still work. I'm still a mother and I still study as well. So um, with UNISA, it was easier because I'm, I was doing everything from home. But at first it wasn't easy to study, just to make it clear. <laughs> um, um, <laughs> where I come from is a very um, underprivileged place and um, we didn't have a school in the beginning. I mean, there was no school. In 1977, there was no school in the area. My parents didn't go to school. And in, in, in 1978, that's when the school started. And uh, my parents were already teenagers, they couldn't go to school. And it was only a primary school. So even those who went to the primary school finished mm -hmm. their grade seven and stayed at home or they started working as um, helpers or just dropping out. And then in 1999, that's when the high school started with us. I was in grade eight and then there were others in grade nine. And those who were in grade nine were those who left Tondeldos to go to their families to study further. So when they heard that, okay, now the area has... Um, a, a, a high school now they came so it was only um two grades then it was um grade um eight and grade nine and then as years progressed and it was only three classrooms and um four educators including the principal so wow. as years progressed as years progressed they added more uh, grades but the classrooms remained the same and the teachers remained the same. So our school had a lot of challenges whereby in 2002, the first matriculants got to 0%. And in 2003, now we were pressurized because we were the second class of metric. So we were pressurized now to, to work hard as the Department of Education uh, was, um, I mean, um, planning to move the school to a location that was about... 20 uh, kilometers away from mm -hmm. us on a gravel oh. road. So we were like, we were like, no, we're not going to um, that location for years. There was no um, high school, so we need to save our school. Um, I mean, I, I was born in farms. It's, it's farms where we were living, and um, I mean, there were no neighbors. It's like your 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 home is next to the next to the white man's house, and then it's an open field, and then your neighbor is far at another um, on another white man's farm. 
So um, the school as well was a bit far from us. We walked to school about five to six kilometers. The tuck shops, only two tuck shops, and the one closed down, we were left with one that was about um, five, six kilometers as well from my grandparents' house. So it was that kind of um, um, environment where I grew up. And um, we had no electricity, no, no water supply. So we relied on rivers and um, wood from the forests to make uh, food. But in, uh, in, in 2003, then, as uh, matriculants now um, that um, even the Department of Education was like on us checking whether we will pass to save the school or not. So we had to work very hard. When we started, we were 23. And then in the end, we were only 18 and only six of us passed. Wow. And I was one of the six who passed and saved the school. So wow. that's, um, I, yeah, that's uh, more or less the background. And I, um, I mean, uh, there we hardly communicated in English, Semi. We, we we used our vernacular. Northern Sutu, <laughs> Northern Sutu was our first language in school, and we had Africans and English as, as second languages. And when we couldn't understand anything in English, I mean, in class maybe the teacher is uh, teaching us in English and we don't understand. They would use vernacular to explain to us right. during school break. We used during school breaks we used our languages, and even at home we hardly communicated in English. So for me to start and studying on my own, it was a big challenge. Like um, for me to understand, like I had to work extra hard because English was, uh, or, yeah, English was a bit um, problematic to me. But yeah, through um, reading a lot of books and watching movies, I was able to um, get it right in the end. Now, um, taking you back to that time where you, you wanted to save the school, what was really going on as in, um, was it this maybe a plan that you as students had or maybe the whole area was saying, please, you guys, you have to study and save the school? Um, this initiative of trying to say we have to pass to save the school, uh, who started it? Was it the parents or the students? No, it wasn't um, the parents per se, because the parents were not really informed about it. And the Department of Education didn't come and inform us like formally, but they had already told the head of the school that that's what's going to happen, and they had informed us. So it was upon us now, um, children, to say, no, we are not going there. And luckily, the educators and even the head of the school were behind our movement. So um, that's why we were able now to... Um, I mean, uh, the Tondeldos was able to be saved, but it was now um, on us that we work hard. Had Tondeldos um, Secondary School um, got 0% in 2003 as well, if we all failed in 2003 as well, it was definitely going to be moved. So we had to work hard so that at least one or two learners pass to convince mm -hmm. the, um, in the department that, no, the school is working hard. Because if the first metric gets 0%, then it's alarming that maybe there's something wrong that the school is not um, uh, doing well. Now, um, with the second metric getting, um, I mean, um, six students uh, passing, and then it was a success because the school was saved in the end. We, 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 it wasn't moved. Right. So how was it like, did you have the resources like books and everything uh, for you to be able to really uh, study and uh, and pass? Did the school have the resources or you, you also didn't have enough? You had to maybe share books or not even have books? We, we didn't have enough resources. Well, we have our books, yes. But we didn't have enough resources. And sometimes with the textbooks as well, we'll borrow each other. And uh, the classrooms were a challenge. And uh, as um, I mean, sometimes we'd find out that one grade, one grade has to do another subject and or it had to be split in between that others are doing maybe home economics, others are doing agriculture. So now um, you found out that it's raining outside. There is a window tree outside where we used to um, sit and um, study there when another class had to do another subject. And, um, you know, it, it was, you no know, the resources were not there at all. And the teachers, I mean, it was hard work for them. And they, um, I mean, there were only four, including the principal. Our, our principal, 
had to teach English from grade eight to grade 12. And all other teachers had to teach more than one subject from grade eight to grade 12. So they were all like, they were doing all the work themselves. I mean, in all grades. Wow. Yeah. So after then, after you matriculated, what happened? Well, what, what was the next step? You passed, then what? After I matriculated and uh, we didn't have career expos, né? there was no one who came to the school to motivate us, to tell us what is it that we need to do. And I mean, it's farms and um, the teacher and um, the other teacher, Mr. Eric Dimane, he used to um, teach us maths, biology and physics. And then at the later stage, he just taught us maths. So Mr. Dimane, um, and, uh, he encouraged us a lot. He um, told us that if you work very hard at the later stage, you can be whatever you want to be. And yeah, but he didn't tell us how to be whatever we want to be. Right. And um, so I moved from the farms and I moved to now um, Dondeldu. I mean, I moved from Dondeldu's to Guamshanga now because Dondeldu's, it was my grandparents' house. So my parents had a shack in Guamshanga. And my mother was a domestic worker and my father was um, working in constructions. And um, at the later stage, he, he stopped working. So it was only my mother doing domestic work. And, um, and then we lived in a shack in, a shack in Wamshanga. And living in a shack in Wamshanga now, um, I was just at home doing nothing. And um, I got then information about um, um, NFSAs and, um, and Tuane University of Technology and other universities that, um, I mean, uh, where NFSAs assist um, with education. And I planned that, okay, I will study. I'll carry on studying and, and do something with my life because now I was at the area that encouraged me where I could see right. young girls driving cars and, you know, and um, I mean, me in my area where I grew up in Tondeldos, um, you could hardly, there was actually no ladies who had cars and all that. Like the, the education there was, there was no hope for education, if I can put it that way. And um, now in Wamshanga, now I thought, no, I have to push now and study. And as I was planning that, I will um, register now and carry on with my studies. And then I fell pregnant. Right. And I, yeah. And um, after falling pregnant, Yes, um, as I was saying that um, as um, when I planned to um, now um, register and carry on with my studies and then I fell pregnant and that helped me back now because I had to be a full-time mother and I was a teenager. I was not financially, physically or mentally um, ready to be a mother, but I had to now face or um, suffer the consequences because I put myself in that kind of situation and my mom was still working she couldn't stay with my daughter so I was a full-time mother and then you know um, there was no money so I had to um, I had those you know those white um, I mean, um, nappies the ones that you wash and yes 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 <laughs> so yeah yeah yes it was it was a bit challenging but yeah yeah, I was a full-time mother, and um, during that time, I took a driver's license because in South Africa then um, there was um, hope when you had um, a driver's license and a metric. They wanted a lot of um, police then, police officers. So, um, and the only requirement was a metric and a driver's license. So, um, I I I, I um, took a driver's license. And through family's assistance, yes, because I didn't have money for it. So um, um, I, they assisted me. I took a driver's license and I wanted to be a police officer. Oh, nice. <laughs> and But um, looking for that employment was for um, just getting out of the situation. It was in my passion. I was scared of guns. You know, I was scared. Oh, yes. but, but each time I realized that I want uh, employment, I would convince myself that nah, I'll hold that gun. It's fine. Like, I'm okay. <laughs> <laughs> and um uh, no it didn't work i couldn't find employment and um i realized that now I, I can't stay at home my daughter was about to turn three and i was like i cannot stay at home and do nothing i have to do something with my life and i started looking for employment as a domestic worker and looking for that employment it was um because at, at some stage 
when I was in Tondel, was from grade seven to grade 12, I was working on a farm. There was another farm called, uh, called Froki, uh, Froki Pond Farm. So what Froki Pond Farm did, it was a lavender farm and it would make nice, beautiful things for the house with uh, flowers. Mm -hmm. And it was, it had guest houses as well. So uh, I worked there picking up flowers, drying them, that kind of sort of like small jobs on Saturdays and on school holidays. And as years progressed and the lady taught me how to clean the houses. So I always had extra cash when I was in Tondelbos. So when I was home and I had like nothing and I would run out of cash, then I realized that no, the only job I can do now is um, domestic work. Well, Guamsanga, where I'm from, where I am from now, where, where my parents uh, build their house, is about 60, kilo, 60 or 70 kilometers away from Pretoria. And Pretoria like had a lot of employers, uh, white or black employers. So uh, there is Patco buses traveling like uh, on Muloto Road. I don't know, maybe in Beijing as well, you know about Muloto Road because it's highest on accidents. And, <laughs> and we, I travel by bus now looking for employment using the Sasa grant um, that I received because I received um, a Sasa grant. I remember it was still 250 then. And then I used it for um, to look for employment. And it wasn't easy to get that employment, Simi. I was very skinny. I was very young. And employers wanted, uh, you know, big ladies. They trusted big ladies for a job and much hot ones. So I was young. They couldn't believe that um, I could do the job. So I would go and sit at church looking for the job. We'd go and sit at parks looking for the jobs. But at the later stage, I registered um, through an agency and... I mean, on a newspaper, then they, 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 they contacted me and I would go for interviews and so others would just tell me that, no man, you are young, you, you won't be able to do the job. And then to those who um, opened the doors for me, I worked really hard to prove myself. And since then, I never went back home. They recommended me and recommended and until I got a full-time employment. And uh, when I got the full-time employment, that's when I bought a computer now. Right. No, I, I have a question. I, I know, um, you know, domestic work, some people really think of it as maybe one of the lowest jobs. You had matriculated, yes. you could even find a job as maybe as a waiter, you know, at this chicken yes. place where they sell this chicken, I, I don't know, what, what, Nando's. Yes, and, yes, yes. Why, why, why were you thinking of domestic work and not thinking like, okay, let me do this? What made you think of domestic work instead of any other? Job? Well, same. At that stage, I wasn't confident. As I'm saying that, you know, right. communication was still a barrier to me. So I wasn't confident, even working at the restaurant, I thought I won't be able to communicate with them. I mean, at the restaurant, you need to be, I mean, be able to communicate well, I mean, taking orders and all that. So to me, it was going to be a serious barrier. Right. So I know, I knew very well that I won't succeed in that. And even employers, I, I wasn't confident uh, when going to interviews as well. So I thought this one, I know very well. If someone opens the door and they leave me alone because I don't have to interact with anyone. I'm just in the house alone and I do the work. So I can prove myself like physically, but when it come when it came to communication, it was still a, a serious uh, problem. So um I chose domestic work because it was the best option for me then. Right. And then uh, I'll also, whilst we're still there, I mean, you know, some girls that we have nowadays, some would say, I would not yes. do this job. I would rather maybe sell myself. Right. So you had yes. so many options, but then you still said, OK, I'm not going to to do this. I am not going to go to the clubs. I'm not going to prostitute myself, but I would rather yes. take that route. So, um this is something that maybe before we even continue, like we might have some young girls, maybe even while watching right now, who might be, you know, going through that and you feel like, okay, I'm not confident enough in this and I, I can't take this, but then I, I would prefer to have maybe uh, this old man look after me or, you know, all those, all those things. What can you say yeah. to a young person who's going through that? And like you're saying that you also had a baby. So you wanted to really look yeah. after your child. But at the same time, there are people who would say, 
I don't care what I'm going to do as long as I'm getting the money. So it doesn't matter yes. what job as long as I'm I'm getting the money. What can you say to that girl, to that young girl, maybe another single mom, another teen mom who is just there sitting and saying I maybe we don't even have a uh, metric, who doesn't have right so what what can you yes. actually say do you feel like when you just took that step back of like i would do that to myself and start here i would know later on i'll move up or then you didn't even know you were going to move up did you have an idea like i'm okay. going to change my life or it was just for that particular time No, I had an idea that I would change my life. So I wanted the job so I could pay for my studies. So um what I would say to young girls out there, you know, Sammy, uh, sometimes we we blame God or blame ourselves or blame our parents that we are born in in poverty or we are born underprivileged. And it, sh- it shouldn't be the case. You know, God didn't make a mistake with our lives. God knows our lives and um I mean a uh, God if God wanted me to be born in Beijing, I wouldn't be in South Africa. Right. If God wanted me to be born in a rich family, I wouldn't be born where I was born. Mm. So uh, I wouldn't have been born there. So now God knows our lives. So we shouldn't give ourselves because now our bodies are a temple of God. That's what God says. So we shouldn't but without judging one another. We should just like try to guide one another and what I'm trying to say now is I am not judging my sisters. I understand where they're coming from, but mm. they should look at it at another angle now just say just looking at it that you know what even if you can have a sugar daddy but it is not your money it's his money and he's going to control you but if it's something that you have worked hard for like you have you 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 you, you like you you work hard for just to get what you have you'll have pride in it like you'll have a story to tell your children because you should still be able to sit down with your children and guide them and tell them that you know what i've worked very hard to be um to to achieve this so um, to my sisters i understand and i'm i'm not saying what they are doing is wrong or right but all i'm saying is they should fight for themselves they shouldn't rely on other people um to do their work for them and they shouldn't choose employment because choosing employment it's something that um that's holding us back as well so if you if if there's anything if you if you see that we have communication barrier just do something with your hands find f- find find out what is it that you can be you can do with your hands if it's making clothes if it's baking if it's just try to find out what is it because there is no way that you, uh, i mean you you are not um gifted there is a gift that god gave you all of us god gave us a gift you know you know semi uh, before we even go further i mean when i wrote my book um it's it's brightness of diamonds through soil so the reason for this um i mean title is um i want i want everyone actually everyone even at the at at at, the, at underprivileged um area to know that they've got a special gift you know diamonds cr- come from a soil and we are also made out of, out of soil if you know how adam how adam was created mm-hmm. and in other, in us there is a special gift there is a special gift we haven't figured out that gift yet because we are covered by poverty i mean there are a lot of things that are covering us and of which i understand but all i'm saying is if we push if we dig uh, deeper you know when you dig deeper as miners do when they want gold and we push as well to dig deeper just to find out what is the gift that god gave me when right. i was born what is it like there's no way that god can bless others with gifts and he doesn't bless me god loves us all mm-hmm. so what is my gift if you dig deeper to find your gift you will uh, you, you you will surprise yourself you will realize that only the sky is the limit for me Wow, that's so powerful. <laughs> that's so powerful. <laughs> And how long did you work as a as a domestic worker? How long were you working? I as? I worked as a domestic worker for five years. Wow. I started in um to I started in 2007 and now traveling by bus doing peace jobs. And then in 2008 I I I worked full time and until in 2011 I was a full time um, employee. 
Wow. So you were living in there, you were living or you were going back and forth home and back? Were you living? Were you no, in, to, in 2008, yes, in 2008, it was a stay-in job. I lived with the family. In 2007, I was traveling, like I traveled home. But in 2008, I lived in with a family and I had my back room and that's where things started in the small um, back room, a Wendy house. It was a beautiful Wendy house and that's where things started. And by the way, um, I mean, um, it, my first time experience with, with electricity, it was then when I, when I was about to 10 at uh, 22, when I stayed full time, wow. um, um, I mean, um, as a domestic worker now working um, as a domestic worker. Uh, in, in farms, we didn't have electricity. And when we moved to Wamshanga, it was... Um, a new development so they didn't want to um i mean oh okay it, it delayed like the process of giving us electricity delayed because there was sort of like a misunderstanding uh, between um the the councillor and the tribal office so it took us it took years we arrived there in 2004 january actually 2003 and then 2004 january that's when i started living in a shack with my younger sister now and we didn't have electricity until in 2008 so if you can count how many years that we stayed without electricity, that it was four, five, six, seven full, and then eight. So it was four and a half. And in farms, we also didn't have electricity. So my first time with, with electricity, it was when I was about to turn 22. Wow. And how was it? <laughs> this is what you were, we were working, and you're working at a place where you cannot use electricity. How was it like? How was yes. that? I can imagine there, the stove and everything. How was everything like your experience? I just found it, um, I just, I, I found it very um, interesting and it was just an easiest way to make things, to make food, to, you know, and to, 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 to get information as well, because, you know, when you don't watch TV or listen to a radio, we had a radio, yes, but we had to monitor it because we used the battery. You know those PM9 and PM10 batteries. That's what we batteries. That was that's what we used, and we would be like careful that we we're not sort of like listening to the radio all the time. Otherwise, the battery will be flat, and we will right. have to buy another battery. So now it was easier now, and even listening to the radio every now and then, and watching TV. So it helped me a lot as well on. Um, getting uh, my communication right now yeah so i found it very easier but whenever the power was off uh, i would feel like to me it will be like yes the power is off. <laughs> <laughs> because i use candles for for almost 22 years so now the power is off it will be back it's only for seconds <laughs> <laughs> that's good so now when you were there this is where you then uh, decided okay you want to do your degree and you had your computer you registered how supportive was your employer did your employer know that maybe you're also studying at the same time did you tell them or it's something that you did without them knowing no, I did everything with them knowing, but I didn't start with the degree. I started with um, the Microsoft Office. Okay. So, um, yes, the employer was supportive. I bought the computer myself. As I said in the beginning that I still earned less than 2000 and the computer was 800 so I bought the computer myself, and um, after buying that computer, um, they assisted me upgrading the computer so I could study. And I looked now for a course, Microsoft course, and I got it at another college here in South Africa called Inter College. And when I found that um, course, I started studying. But at the later stage when I had to write, at every month I paid 461 rand for the course, and I would be left with um, sort of like more or less, <laughs> I mean, about one point something. And I still had to take care of my daughter at home and mm. buy things for her. So it was a lot of sacrifice. And um, when I had to write exams now, actually, I thought I'm studying, I'm submitting assignments because I would get feedback every now and then doing everything on my own and I would submit. And and then I thought, ah, they'll just give me a certificate and say, no, you've made it. No. I, had, I still had to write exams, but the challenging part was um, that they were not accredited by Microsoft. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. So I am um, they they said to me I should go to another institution that is accredited by Microsoft but at that institution I had to pay extra uh, now for it's for exams me. and it's something that I didn't know of and I didn't ask and I didn't ask in the beginning now it was time for me to get a certificate but I can't get I couldn't get it because I have still had to write exams and I told myself at that stage my bank balance was at minus and i told myself ah i'll just leave this and um write exams later when i have money but now my employer supported me said to me no we have seen how passionate you are about this i'll pay for your exams the exams were about um less than or about 2.2500 and she paid that 2500 i wrote and then at the later stage i got um, the certificate i was extremely mm-hmm happy you know when i thought of where i come from and i couldn't communicate and then the next thing i'm doing this certificate and and then i just i i get it like i saw i saw um one door opening for me so i, I was so happy wow so from then onwards now you are geared up to try something bigger that's when you got into the your degree yes from there i was geared up when i am um, worked as um, um a receptionist at the physiotherapist because i got that employment because of having this now microsoft office certificate she wanted that she wanted the microsoft office as well and a metric and um and at her place i started driving around them sometimes she would send me to places driving around and i did her accounts as well and uh, during that year when i worked for the physiotherapist i did office management certificate with unisa starting on my own as well and um when 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 the sif- when the certificate came back i i passed it with um um, um i mean distinction mm-hmm. i was super excited i was proud of myself and uh, doing that certificate it was just to test how deep the water was because i wasn't sure whether i would do well with the degree <laughs> and uh, considering the communication barrier or the language barrier and when i got it with distinction i was geared up again for um, a bigger thing so since i started working since i started working as a domestic worker i, ne- I never put a pen down i carried on studied and studied and studied Wow, this is amazing, you know. I love the zeal that you had of like, you know, from where you came from and still trying to elevate yourself and going on and believing that, you know, someday I'm going to get there. Now, when it came to picking your degree, you said you did public administration, right? How did you choose that? I know there's so many degrees out there. How, why did you pick that one? Semi, I still had a challenge with communication. Mm-hmm. Yes, I would communicate. I would communicate, but uh, I wasn't confident enough mm-hmm. with my communication skill considering the barrier of where I grew up or, or considering of the area where I grew up. So um, I still had a little bit of barrier. I wasn't confident. Sometimes I would know what to say, but I would um, not feel confident enough to say it because the how part was a bit challenging. So I thought, let me do public administration and uh, communications. And um, it was the best degree for me. And um, I was happy about it because public administration here in South Africa is about how the government functions. Yeah. And, and I was interested to know how the government functions because I wanted answers on how come that for the rest of my childhood, I didn't have electricity. So, <laughs> and the communications part assisted me now on being confident now um, about mm-hmm. communication. And um, that is why now I'm able to communicate with you here. <laughs> amazing um this is <laughs> do you know like um i'm just uh, trying to to really look at your journey and and stuff and um you mentioned earlier on that you also wrote a book what made you write a book yes what what, what made you write uh, the book uh- Okay, so me in 20 um 18 December. You know, I was I was so excited after graduating and my sisters were there, my parents were not there. Like I celebrated my graduation like almost every single day. I would feel like it's a celebration. And um after graduating now, I I I um it was in December 2018. 
I shared the picture on Facebook that showed that in 2007 I was here and now it's 2018 I'm graduating because I got my degree at the age of 33. And um, when, when, when I shared that picture on Facebook, it went viral. Everyone shared the picture. They said it's an inspirational story. That's you cannot where just I saw tell it. us a half story. <laughs> That's where I best you. In school. <laughs> That's how I found yeah, you. And, <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> and when they said that, that the story is inspirational, we want to know more, then I thought um, it's better if I put it on a book, yes. And um, it's through my social media friends that encouraged me to um, write this book. And I thank everyone for encouraging me to write this book. I hope this book will serve the purpose. I pray to God that the book reaches the masses, more especially the girls, the young girls, or the young boys, even those who are underprivileged and who feel hopeful, who have communication barriers, who don't feel like confident enough to communicate. Um, I hope that the book reaches them so that they know that if they read a lot of books, even where they are, if they read a lot of books and they will be fine, they'll just make it fine. I mean, I find myself now working with people who went to, I mean, um, good universities and we communicate well, like there's no barrier at all. So um, I, the book now is to encourage the young ones there. That's why I sat down and, and thought, you know, if people say to me, Give us more of yourself. Tell us more. We want to be inspired. Let me give them the story because they have requested. I didn't want to sit there, not write a book and ask myself at the later stage, I wonder what would have happened if I had written the book. So I thought, no, I better put, I mean, I better write and um, tell the story and motivate as much as possible. Right. Wow. That's that's so amazing. No. If people were interested, maybe those who will be listening to us, um, where can they find the book? Is it on sale or some way? way how can they get hold of your book? Okay, Sammy, um, um, just to uh, put it that I am a self-publisher, but the book is going to be available on Amazon. Okay. It's going to be available on Take A Lot here in South Africa. On Take A Lot, it will be available and um, it will be available on, we have a PEC here in South Africa, it's PEP Korea, you are able to um, Korea um, via PEP. But for everyone in Beijing or in America, or the book it will be available yeah. on Amazon, so you'll Amazon. be able to grab it from Amazon. Okay, that's, that's and beautiful. I have, I, have, I have a WhatsApp number as well uh, sure. for anyone. For those who want who to get hold of you, yes. Yeah, you can go okay. ahead and give them, yeah. Okay, the WhatsApp number is um, 082-625-7853. 082-625-7853. And um, my friends can find me on Facebook as well. I'm Dombi Zodwa and uh, Miriam Mashangu. Uh, they should like the page because I've already reached my limit now. On, on my personal <laughs> one, so they, should, they should follow you now. <laughs> they should, uh, <laughs> Yeah, they should like the page, and um, uh, I am available on Twitter. It's at Ntombizotwa Mer One, at Ntombizotwa Mer One, and on Instagram I'm at Ntombizotwa Twenty Eight Eleven, and the email address is angelgazotwa at gmail dot com. Wow, Angel Gazotwa, I like that. <laughs> I like that. You know, what? just listening to, to your story, you know, the reason why I do this Elevate with Sammy is basically to try and have people share their stories. Because most of the times yes. when people see us the way we are now, they don't know what we've been through. So they might look at us yes. and say, oh, you know what? Sammy has a good job or Dombi is doing a good job and, you know, she's living well. But they don't know where you've been. They don't know what you've been yes. through. And sometimes when they look at us or maybe when they look at those people they call celebrities or people that they look up to, they always think, maybe I'm not going to be able to get there. Or how do I get there? So... This idea of having this show is to try and show people that, you know what, in as much as we hear, this is the journey that we've been through and we've managed to cope with the pressures, we've managed to elevate ourselves because sometimes some people tend to give up, you know, when things are yes. so hard. 
people give up. They they would prefer shortcuts. They'll prefer other ways. Some they take their lives and stuff. But you know, the more yeah. they get to listen to different stories and what other people have been through, you know, will try and also encourage yeah. them to say, you know what, don't give up hope because, I mean. Honestly, you know, the things that you've said today, they, they actually touched me to say someone is actually opening up and saying, you know what, hey, I only got experience of using electricity at 22, you know, and someone might yes. say, oh, my God, my life really sucks. Like, I don't have this. But someone is saying, you know what, even though it took me this long, but I've managed to change my life for the better, because sometimes... um I feel that we have the choice. We actually have the choice as in what we want to do. You know, often I hear people saying, oh, I didn't have a choice. I didn't this, I didn't have a choice. But sometimes, you know, it just only takes yourself believing in yourself or telling yourself it's going to be better, you know, and I choose to be positive. So that is a choice that someone makes to say, I choose to be positive. I choose to look at and not look at the now. Things might be hard right now, but I know it's going to be better. So I I am actually so happy that you shared your story. And trust me, when I saw it, I actually saw it on Facebook and I was like, I have to find this woman. I have to. And so that you can really share, really, you know, I saw your picture in, in, in your, uh, <laughs> what domestic working uniform. And I was like, Oh man, this is really something, Do you know, like, um, I think you can actually motivate. You are a great motivator. It's different from someone who just come They've got everything and then they're trying to tell people that, oh, it's going to be okay, you know. Sometimes people don't understand or the yes. you don't know. You don't know what we've been through. But people like you who then come and say, when you're telling someone that, man, it's going to be okay. Someone can actually see it, you know, and and really believe it as compared to a rich person who maybe grew up in everything saying that. So um, this is why, you know, I kind of do this. Like there are people that really need to hear the journeys that we actually pass through, the challenges and how we manage to say, no matter what, no matter. And one thing that I also like is the honesty that you have. Do you know, most people, they hide their stories. You know, they would hide it. I mean, yes. Now yes. that you've got your credit, whatever job, you wouldn't want to be related to, you know, back home where you were. But I I, I just love the, the way that, you know, you're open about it. You're not shy about it. That's who you are. And that's made you who you are. And, and, and it's really, really powerful even for our young people out there, for our single mothers out there, you know, it's like, even I think your daughter will be really, really proud to actually see that, Hey, you know what? My mom went through this and now look at where she is. That is uh, really powerful. Really. I am, I'm touched actually. I am so touched because I've I've seen people who would not want to talk about their backgrounds. Never. Never, never, never. Not yes. Really. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So Yes. No, thank you. Th- thank you so much, Semi. And um, um, what, I, what I would like to say again is that people shouldn't be ashamed of their backgrounds. You know, I love that uniform so much. Um, I have it here. And <laughs> sometimes I just feel like wearing that uniform and walking in the streets. <laughs> and people shouldn't be ashamed of the kind of jobs that they do, Semi. I mean, it's, it's not their fault. It is really, you know, if we through, if we can understand that it is not our fault that we are in poverty and it's not someone's fault. It's God's plan with our lives. Yes. So if, if God wanted us to be rich, it would have been so. So blaming one another now, it's, it's, it, 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 it's going to take us nowhere. So mm-hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm this kind of a person who sort of like 
um, try by all means not to blame someone for my life. Like I'm not blaming my parents. My parents didn't have an opportunity to go to school. I don't blame anyone. I trust God with my life because blaming one another is going to create, you know, um, grudges and hatred. Right. And then the next thing we're going to be angry ancestors because we died with hatred, you know, <laughs> you know. <laughs> <laughs> so it's it, you know, uh, it's we shouldn't blame one another, and we shouldn't be ashamed. I mean, um, exactly. and domestic workers should really because domestic workers raise teachers, they raise doctors, they oh, raise, yes. you know, okay. professors. So, so, so domestic workers should be should be um, I mean, um, um, respected. Our mothers work very hard there, and our fathers as well. They do that job so that we can eat, even if we cannot go to school, but we survive. You know, my mom couldn't go to school. Yes, she couldn't pay for my studies, but she contributed a lot in my life. I mean, mm-hmm. she she took care of me, so that means a lot. I wouldn't be this person if it wasn't for her buying clothes for us or making clothes for us. She had to go. My mom um had to learn. Uh, a seamstress she was a seamstress she had to learn sewing job at the later stage because we were four and she couldn't afford when Mm. my dad lost job lost the job and um she made clothes for us and um if it wasn't for her and for perseverance and for for her hard work maybe i would have given up as well maybe i would have like i wouldn't be this kind of person so Mm. um so it's what I'm saying is we need to respect our mothers and we need to love them unconditionally. My parents passed away. Unfortunately, everything happens now. I graduate and I yeah, write this book. They're not there they are not see, part yeah. of it. But yeah, they are not there to see. But um, all I'm saying is big up to all domestic workers. Big up to everyone who's doing an odd job out there. Don't be ashamed. If you are selling sweets in Beijing, Go and stand at the corners if they allow mm. you in Beijing. Here in South Africa, you are allowed. You can stand at the corner and sell your business. And I mean, uh, promote your business. So if they allow it in Beijing as well, don't be ashamed. You don't owe anyone an explanation with your life. Okay. You owe only God. Mm. So don't try to uh, fit in and live a life that you can afford or and you'll be happy at all times. Wow. Thank you so much. And um, what are your last words? What can you say uh, to people out there as your last words? What advice can you give either single mothers, young people, or just anyone? What advice can you tell them? Just your last words before we close. Okay, my last words are, your life is not a mistake. Work hard. Find your gift. There is a diamond, special diamond in you. Find it. Dig deeper. Minus sweat. They don't like just walk around and pick a gold. You know, they sweat. They dig deeper to find that gold. So work hard to find your gold. Persevere. If you haven't um, figured out what your gold is now, it doesn't mean that um, you won't figure out, you don't you won't figure out later. Be hopeful. Trust in the Lord and know that it's never too late. Education. I acquired my qualification at the later stage, and don't be like um, I mean. Um, discouraged and uh, be told that you are older or you are a failure, those words don't make them active. They are active until you entertain them. If someone tells you that you can't go anywhere, just ignore that and just tell yourself that, you know, God has a plan with my life. It's only God who can tell us where we're going because he's the one who's like um, um, showing us the, the way to go. And we need to pray hard now to God that at all times, He's with us, and when God is with with us, no one can be against us. Mm -hmm. So what I want to say to people out there is that please do not give up your dream. Don't give up your dream. It might not be now. It might not be tomorrow, but it will eventually happen if you persevere and if you are hopeful at all times and if you know that God is with you. If you're trusting him, nothing will go wrong. Right. Wow. Wise words. Thank you so much, Dombi, for joining me today. Uh, It was really, really a great story, and I hope it touched people out there.